In this second video on capital budgeting, let's explore uh, net present value and internal rate of return a little deeper. So the first technique or tool that we can talk about is something called a net present value profile. This is just a graphical representation of the project's net present value at different levels of financing costs of capital. So here you see that we have a short table, our weighted average cost of capital ranging from zero to 20. And then we calculated the net present value for each one of those uh, particular, for each project, L and S, at each different weighted average cost of capital. Now the one thing hopefully you will notice is that as weighted average cost of capital increases, as the discount rate increases, the value of the asset decreases. So there is a negative relationship between required returns and value. So what does this look like graphically? So graphically, if we have an individual project, as we graph, here's net present value. And again, as discount rate increases, we're going to find that the net present value decreases. And there is a point where the internal rate of return crosses the zero axis. So to the right of this intersection, we have negative net present values. So any discount rate that we have that is less than this intersection would be an acceptable project. The net present value would be greater than zero. And indeed, where it crosses this intersection, by definition, the internal rate of return is the discount rate that gives us a net present value equal to zero. So anything less than that would again imply a positive kind of a project where the internal rate of return is greater than the discount rate of the project. Now, if we look at in the uh, mutually exclusive projects, what we will find is that there are conflicts that we'll find, right? That when you're looking at these two projects, L and S, what we find is there is a range where L has a higher net present value than S, and then there's also a range where S is greater than L. So let's look at the internal rate of return. Here's the internal rate of return for L, and here's the internal rate of return for S. Now you can tell that what? S is higher than L. So if we're looking at these projects, if you only look at internal rate of return, S would always be better than L. However, if you look at net present value, you find that depending on the discount rate, L might at some point be better than S and in other times vice versa. So there's a crossover point. There is a point here, roughly 8.7%. We'll see how we can calculate that maybe in a minute. Well, we can see that what? There are certain times when L's better or higher than S. So if we do this graphically, we can do this, uh, take the projects. Um, there is a workbook that's provided that has a worksheet for net present value profiles where you can input the cash flows and it will calculate the net present profiles for the projects. And again, you can see here is the crossover point. Another form of analysis is we can go to what's referred to as the project risk analysis, or trying to choose between two projects. This is where in the beginning, we talked in another video how the incremental cash flow is very important. So essentially, we have two projects project A and B, in this case that's L and S, you input the cash flows 
and it calculates the incremental cash flows for us, we see that we still have the same net present values and discounted cash and internal rate of return. But what this crossover tells us, or what the this analysis tells us, is that uh, says uh, the question here is: Should we do Project A? Well, you should only do Project A if it provides more value than Project B. In the case here, you see that we have actually a negative one, right? So that means that B is better than A. And of course, we knew that. Now, the crossover point is 8.68%. So as a manager, what this tells us is if the discount rate is less than the crossover rate, Project A net present value would actually be greater than Project B. If it's to the right of that, if your discount rate, weighted average cost of capital were higher, say 10%, then uh, the second project, S, would be a better project. So this helps management understand the relationship between the values of the projects and the cost of financing those projects. So why is there a conflict? There are two basic reasons that all kind of add up, um, I guess, to a third reason, if you will. But two of the reasons for differences, uh, it, it all have to do with the math, by the way, right? The size of the cash flows, the size of the, the project itself. You know, the smaller the project is going to free up more money sooner timing right cash flows that come sooner are going to be able to be reinvested sooner and that's going to ultimately affect the cash flows and the tech the calculation of the cash flows in these these techniques now this all kind of boils down to though is something referred to as the reinvestment rate assumption right so the scale and the timing that gives us a structural thing right but the reinvestment rate is conceptual right it says look the net present value assumes that cash flows are reinvested at the weighted average cost of capital from a logic perspective right this makes perfect sense to us the cost of financing is the weighted average cost of capital so you would never invest money if you thought you were going to earn less than what the cost of financing was. So the net present value follows a logical assumption on how the business actually works. Now the internal rate of return method assumes the cash flows are reinvested at the internal rate of return. Now again, this is a mathematical challenge if you will right it's the math that causes this but if you think logically right if you had a really really good project maybe the best project you've been able to come up with the internal rate of return assumes that every cash flow from this project and every cash flow from the projects thereafter from when this money is reinvested they're all going to be reinvested at this very high rate because it's such a good project. And that just isn't the way business works, right? Business works, just to kind of backtrack, as an assumption that we always invest at a minimum so that we can at least get our cost of financing back from a project. So maybe we need something to help us with the internal rate of return. And there is another technique. This is a hybrid they refer to. It's called the modified internal rate of return. Again, this is just a discount rate that causes the present value of the project, right, to equal the present value of its cost. So I think a picture does a little bit better than words here. So this is what MIR does. It says, look, 
we're going to take these future cash flows, here's Project L, and we're going to reinvest them at the weighted average cost of capital. So you can see here the weighted average cost of capital is 10%. What this creates us, that is, we invested 10% here, uh, or $10 at 10% for two years. We invested $60 here at 10 percent for a year and then we received 80. So the future value of this project of reinvesting these cash flows at the weighted average cost of capital again, is this $158. Now the modified internal rate of return is a calculation much like the MI uh, or like the internal rate of return it says look if you spend $100 and you end up with $158 what rate of return was that? In this case, the MIRR, Modified Internal Rate of Return, is 16.5%. Now this helps us with many of the challenges with internal rate of return. How do we calculate this in Excel? Fortunately, we have a formula. It's MIRR. Now, and obviously then you put parentheses. Now we have all of the cash flows from zero to N. The next line is the finance rate, right? That's the weighted average cost of capital. And then the second interest rate you input is the reinvestment rate. So what this ultimately uh, it assumes, right, is that money is reinvested at the weighted average cost of capital, which makes sense to us. And then we would accept any project then that has a modified internal rate of return greater than the weighted average cost of capital. So for our two projects, we see the modified internal rate of return for L is 17%. And I know decimals here, we, we could put decimals for surely. And the modified internal rate of return is 18%. So again, S has a higher modified internal rate return than L. If these were mutually exclusive, you would choose S over L. Both projects though have a MIRR greater than 10%. So both projects are acceptable. So just to kind of backtrack just a little bit, MIR assumes a reinvestment at the opportunity cost, right? It also helps us with some other issues that we're not going to really discuss much in this class or in this video about multiple IRRs and the non-normal cash flows that we might have in other projects. Uh, so managers like rate of return comparisons, right? They would rather use percentiles, percentages rather than net present value. It's just kind of easier to understand and explain. But MIR is a better use than the internal rate of return, especially for some uh, bizarre problems that may help us or hurt us when we're trying to actually even calculate the internal rate of return. So that's it for this video. I look forward to seeing you next time.